five, four, three. Well, if it's Tuesday, you know, that can only mean one thing. It is time for us to get together and talk about the craft and business of making comics. And I have to tell you, these are two guests that I have, I personally am a fan of, and I'm sure that many of you are, and we're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, they've uh, generously offered us behind the scenes, showing us how their comics are created uh, as far back as the 80s. Yep. Some of these comics came out before some of you were born, including my very youthful and handsome uh, partner, Mike Fasolo. Mike, <laughs> this is your genre. You love this kind of genre, right? This is good stuff. All fancy good stuff. Yeah, it is all fancy. I remember we were talking about it. You were like, hey, I like this. Yeah. So, Mike, uh, our, our guests are uh, legends, Eisner Award legends. They've done it all. They have created, they've published, they continue to be creative uh, decade after decade. I mean, it's almost hard to even imagine going that long. But the spark of the idea was so strong uh, that this uh, team has worked together um, and just continue to generate an output of comics that is enviable from all professionals. And I, I'm excited because they are, they have a true independent spirit. Mike, please welcome our guests, Wendy and Richard Peeney. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hello. We're excited. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm supposed to give you the, hold on. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the studio audience. I don't know if you saw them behind us, but we, we get them yeah. to go on cue. So. So we we really are excited. You, your your first published Elf Quest was a, according to Wikipedia, 1978. Is that right? Mm -hmm. it's, Wikipedia got it right this time. <laughs> wow. Um, first of all, though, I got to say props to you for the snappiest intro. Oh yeah. Uh, we have yet experienced. <laughs> it's just yeah, I mean, we're pumping here. Very impressive. Um, yeah, and, and you brought the audience, man. I, I got to tell you, their people are packing the room already. There oh, are. I love it. Yeah. Allie Rainey. Heck yes. Awesome people. Yeah. And um, I have to tell you, I took a look at some of the uh, the archival materials uh, that you sh shared along. Uh, it's so good. And I think you're going to unpack more than just uh, how you make the comics, but it's all how you conduct yourselves as professionals to have a, a long and illustrious career like you have had. Oh, we just, we try to misbehave as little in an obvious <laughs> way as possible. This is true. <laughs> so conduct yourself as professionals. <laughs> what do you, anyway, uh, <laughs> no, uh, ElfQuest was born essentially the year before in 1977, but the first issue did appear on February 28th, 1978, and we had no idea what we were doing then. We have mm -mm. doubled what we know over the <laughs> being, uh, decades. Um, that actually is not the first appearance. And I knew that, which is why I pulled it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, it is and it isn't a first appearance. It's a first appearance of Warp Graphics. Yes. So. Yes. The very first appearance of ElfQuest was in a a comic-sized magazine called Fantasy Quarterly featuring ElfQuest. It was issue number one and only. It was um, the last thing that another publisher put out before we took it over for various reasons. Um, our first issue was actually number two and then number three. 
and then number four. But by that time, we were doing so well that we thought, no, we'd better reissue number one mm -hmm. to look like what we were already uh, publishing. And what you just showed was that first uh, first edition, first printing, by the way. That's what I call my Frazetta-inspired cover. Yeah, <laughs> very Frazetta-ish. And I, I have to tell you, there are people are already the kind of that's where I started. Um, legend has it, uh, WARP stands for Wendy and Richard Peeney. Is that true? Abs well, absolutely true. Yeah. I, I Imagine if my name had been Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can, or our family name had been Thomas, or you can just spin <laughs> that one out, you know. Well, uh, it's a good thing you had cool names. Yes. 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 Um, so one of the things that you're you had uh, been generous enough to show us was some uh, early um, mm. creative work. Um, can you talk about what we're looking at here on the screen? And, and remember, many of the people who uh, are tuning into the show are uh, aspiring creators or creators yeah. who want to level up and get to the next level. Talk about what we see here on the screen. Well, of course, everything back there back then was hand done. No such thing as digital. So I would write the scripts out uh, in longhand. You can see all the tremendous cross outs <laughs> there uh, as ide ideas came and went and we went for something better. Uh, and then uh, this page has always been one of my favorites because it's, um, oh, it's a little bit romantic. <laughs> But uh, uh, yes, the, the, the big contrast between then and now is, of course, not everybody, but a lot of people for uh, for the ease of it and the efficiency <laughs> use digital um, helpers. Uh, you have Word, you have Word, you have uh, 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 Photoshop, mm -hmm. you have all of these things. But in 19, the mid to late 1970s, what we had was pencil, paper, pen, yeah. and ink. And I never liked typing. I found things went much faster for me if I just wrote them out in longhand. Really? And now, how do you how do you write now? Is is it a is oh is everything word everything problem. is word or text? <laughs> or, you know, I I went fully digital with the artwork back in the early two thousands. Uh, taught myself how to uh, use a Wacom Cintiq and um, just never looked back because, first of all, it helped me meet my deadlines. You know, uh, you spill a bottle of ink on a page and you got to start all over again. You can't just scrape it off. No, you <laughs> cannot. No, there was, there was no control Z. There was no, <laughs> no. undo. Uh, and, and the thing is that we have some of her original art where she did goof. And so what she had to do was to take an X-Acto knife and cut that panel out of mm -hmm. the artboard, mm -hmm. cut another piece, the same size and shape, mm -hmm. put it in there and redraw. The oh, uh, and the production was so I, different then, right? I know, but I'm not. I found out I'm not the only one in the business who did, did that back in those days. Uh, you know, some of the greats had to do the same thing. Replace panels, and then we have from Laura D. I love that her handwriting yeah. looks like a comic book font. I, it, oh, it really well, does, doesn't it? I, yes, I, it I am the worst letterer in the world, so thank you, sweetheart. That's really <laughs> but 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 uh, Nate Picos, who is mm -hmm. the supreme letterer who does our uh, uh, Elf Quest for Dark Horse, wanted to create a font that was exclusively Elf Quest that he could do digital lettering with, so he took examples of Wendy's lettering and created the ElfQuest font, mm -hmm. which is used uh, every issue of Final Quest and Stargazer's Hunt was lettered with the ElfQuest font, and it's based on so her hand lettering. If I was a good letterer, that's how well I would have lettered. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's terrific. And I want to show, I think we were going to just talk about that now. Uh, talk to us about uh, what we're looking at here, which is being published by Dark Horse, the Elf Quest Stargazer's Hunt. Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, this is the most recent cover I've painted, and this is the first time that Skywise, who has always been the companion to our champion Cutter, this is the first time Skywise is being featured as the hero of his own story. And he's on his own hero's journey now. And so uh, I kind of wanted to show him in a different light than we've ever seen him before. 
this this cover is the culmination of a two, three, four year dream. Um, on February 28th, 2018, 40 years to the day after the day. Fantasy Quarterly number one came out, the final concluding issue of Final Quest came out and that wrapped up the 40 year hero's journey of Cutter. But it wasn't the end of ElfQuest. And I don't know if there is an end, but <laughs> there were questions left unanswered at the end of Final Quest. So Stargazer's Hunt became the epilogue and it was supposed to be an eight issue series. Dark Horse published the first four issues and then COVID hit mm. and everything went to down. <laughs> Blue blazes. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that you, you have been bringing this epic story along for this long and you still have more stories to tell. Yeah, how do you come oh. up with stories for 40 years worth of stuff? Well, a lot of it is actually autobiographical. <laughs> now that's something a lot of people don't know. Interesting. But to, to greater or lesser extent. Yeah, we take stuff that happens to us or stuff that we really care about and we build a story around it. And you know, the stuff that happens in life is the most universal. Uh, Rich, Richard and I have always believed that fantasy we don't care for the kind of fantasy where you wave a wand and poof there's a dragon or poof there's a unicorn that's that's not our favorite thing but we love fantasy that is a a commentary on the human condition and that of course is the essence of what elf quest is everything's symbolic in a way or a metaphor and very often we took things that happened to us in our lives and we put them into the story in a metaphorical way. Plus, Wendy had the seed idea for ElfQuest way back um, before the 70s, in fact, because she's been telling stories like this all her life. But in 77, she told me the skeleton of ElfQuest. And it was in a framework way complete 40 years of story was all there yeah once you've got once you've got the framework you can take all kinds of side trips which we did believe me <laughs> but yeah. but, uh, but you, we always had a direction to go you if, know if you know where you start yeah. and you know where you're going to end up you can go all over the map, but you still have that destination. Do you, do you think the viewers out there would like to know one of the things that really happened to us that's in the story? I yeah. think so. The comments are flying through. I'm going to back <laughs> up on the comments. Was, tell, it, tell us. Okay. Which, the fireflies or the squirrel? The fireflies or the squirrel? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a bad romance, Harlequin. <laughs> Um, that was like a good title for your next book. Uh, Talk about the fireflies. Oh, he, okay. He wants me to tell about the fireflies. Okay. Now, I grew up in California. And as you well know, Mike, no fireflies in California. No, nope, nothing. So I had never seen that. Then we get married. I moved back east. And uh, we were living in an apartment complex that uh, was, was bordered by a, a running creek with uh, woods. And one hot, sticky summer night, we were out walking and we came through a bunch of, uh, we passed through a thicket and there was a large field, a large open field beyond, and it was filled with fireflies. I had never seen it. <laughs> it was like all the stars in the sky had fallen down into that field. And, I, I'm, and my mind and my heart recorded it. So when the moment came, in the ElfQuest story for Cutter and Lita to be reunited, those fireflies had to be there. Yeah, I just got a little chill. I, I, <laughs> uh, your artist's mind just put it in and you made it into the story. Sure. Somebody had a really great comment I wanted to pull up. Oh. And their comment was, if you could know how your work helped me cop with my cope with my life i'm in my 45th year still today elf quest helped me in therapy to cope with my grieving so thank you from the heart i think i can sign this say this for a lot of your readers and wait one more comment and thank you so much for stargazers hunt you are so lovely 
Oh, well, okay. thank you, Alex. We'll see. The, and the, the mention of grief, uh, really, that is that is what Stargazer's Hunt is for. That was that was the the unfinished symphony. That was the unanswered question because when Cutter passed on, Skywise was filled with an unbearable mm -hmm. grief, and mm -hmm. he had to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. And Stargazer's Hunt is the story of how he does that. And the cover you showed uh, earlier, uh, Dark Horse eventually was able to uh, take the material for all eight issues and put it out into a couple of uh, soft cover, perfect bound volumes. But this cover um, is the cover of the collected hardcover, which is going to be out. Hardcover! <laughs> which is going to be out in November and, and we're thrilled. We love books, especially love hardcovers. And, and lots of extras. Lots of extras that didn't appear in, I, in any of the comics or any of the, of the previous two books. So um, come come this fall, we're, we're just going to be drooling like everybody else. Well, I'm going I'm to make this move along because you, you did show your bookshelves, which are incredible. And I don't want to, to short people that um, Ali notes they do always say you write what you know, taking reality and making it fantasy is such a great methodology. Care to comment on that uh, that creative observation? Because, you know, as Mike pointed out, how the heck do you keep the story going? Oh, it's limitless. If you, if you draw from reality, from your life experiences, they're going to be universal. The mm. most personal things are the most universal things. And they're the most relatable. And most relatable. They are honest. Mm -hmm. They can happen. They mm -hmm. do happen. Yeah, ElfQuest has always had, on account of this one, kind of a science, yeah. a science basis to it, which is really kind of unusual for fantasy. We don't have magic per se, for example. Our, our characters have powers. Those powers have limits because they're, they're existing on a world that tends to limit what they can do. And we deliberately wanted that too. We didn't want superheroes. We didn't want all powerful characters that could solve any problem with their magic. We wanted characters that had to fight through their own limitations and figure out ways to solve problems, maybe without any powers at all, just using their minds and their hearts. So Mike, they couldn't they couldn't use you as a character. You're too powerful. Yes, yeah. is what they're saying. <laughs> what all my that? stories would involve sitting on the couch watching TV. That's yeah. just oh yes. All That's right, so let's let's dive into this because I think uh, you you gave us some great stuff to uh, work with. I know it's a little small for everybody, but we'll um, you can just scale it in later. So, what are we looking at here? This looks like uh, pencil roughs. Oh yes, this is uh, uh, this is from the the pre digital era. Uh, actually, era. actually, no, no, this, this is from the very beginning of Final Quest. Really? Oh, yes. Yes, See, it is. There's Larrigan. I yeah. I mistook. I thought it was from an earlier series. Well, it's you know it's pretty easy. It's it's faint, but uh, yes. And so we have the pencils, and then we we bring in uh, the inks ah. to dimensionalize it, so it's a little easier to see. You want to talk a little bit about uh, bringing it to life with the inks and how how it ch how it changes. Well, the way that it's done is that you can see that uh, where the borders are on this, and you can see that the top panel runs over the borders. But uh, beyond the borders is an area um, that is called the dead zone, and, and inside the borders, uh, the area is, is called live. That's where you want to have your most important uh, information in your artwork. Uh, anything that can run off the page better not be very important at all. But Wendy does love to use that to bleed off the oh, page. Oh, I love bleeds. Because it gives yeah. an extra dimensionality yeah. to the art, as if it's bigger and it's it's extensive. Mm -hmm. And the, the inking process is very much like, for me, like inking with a brush. You know, I... You do it on the... I use a digital stylus and uh, the, the colors, uh, once the color is applied, it just comes to life so beautifully. This is uh, the coloring work of Sunny Strait, my uh, dear friend and assistant for so many years now. And um, we just uh, work together. He, he is able to finish anything I give him 
whether it's a very rough layout or whether I give him a fully inked page, he's just able to finish it. Yeah. yeah. And what I really, I, 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 what I w love is just the little bit of light work that's mm -hmm. done around the eyes mm -hmm. that brings an extra dimension uh, mm -hmm. to your art. I know that we're, we're hitting letters right now, but I just thought that this was great and it seems to capture a bit of that uh, colorful uh, world that you've been building. Well, Sonny understands characters with big eyes very well because his other line of work, his, his other job is uh, that he does voice work for anime. Uh, he works for Funimation. <laughs> Aoa, Sonny! <laughs> Typo. <laughs> and so um, he's very familiar with drawing uh, anime style of characters. And, and of course, ElfQuest was originally influenced by anime and manga. Yeah, and I see that. Yeah, I see that in some of your influences. I, I just want to. I just want to point something out, Wendy and Richard. We yeah. have a, a normal group. We have an unusually large group here. And what <laughs> I think is funny about it is your fans are coming on and they're greeting each other because they already know each other. <laughs> know each other. Like it just happens to be that it's just on Comic Book School Live, but they're like, "Hey, how's it going?" They're, because you clearly, from the photos, have nurtured your community. Well, we, we, we have, and, and we have some helpers, uh, David Mizjewski and Jonathan Woodward, who are helping us do that because mm -hmm. social media is evolving and mutating and metastasizing faster oh than <laughs> I, I, I Look, shudder no, to um, think. No kidding, that's exactly what you said. One of your stories. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, but, but they keep track of all of the new stuff and they help us maintain that feeling of tribe, which in essence is what drives ElfQuest itself. Right there, Veronica said it, right as you were saying it, Richard. Tribe and community. ElfQuest is tribe and community. Laura has a, has, a, has a craft question. Did you find it hard to transition from physical media to digital? I was scared at first. I, I, I felt intimidated. <laughs> but the minute I pick, picked it up and started working with, okay, he's going to tell a story on it. <laughs> I had been using digital in the office for a while because we were setting up letters pages using uh, PageMaker, you know, desktop publishing when it was, you know, the big thing. Um, and somebody said, you need to uh, investigate Photoshop. So I got Photoshop. It's like Photoshop 1.0. Um, and I fought with it and it fought back. And I just, I hated it. But uh, Wendy being the artist, uh, he said, well, let's give her Photoshop. Yeah, he suggested it to me and I was very hesitant. You know? So I put it on so. her computer and within 15 minutes, using a mouse not a stylus a mouse she had drawn the character winnowill as well as if she had painted it with a brush and i just wanted to <laughs> let's just say i took to it <laughs> No computer training, no nothing. <laughs> no. She just picked it up. And so I guess, I guess the answer to Laura was uh, you did not uh, uh, have any trouble making that transition. <laughs> oh, here's the community saying no, hi I, to each other. Hi, oh. hi, hi, community. All right, so here, here, here we go. Let's let's get back to uh, ElfQuest here. And yes. uh, tell me what we're looking at here. I tried to get them side by side so that you could explain it. This, uh, somebody had asked for how you did it then. And how do you do it now? Yes. So the then was the hand letter page with the cross outs and everything else. How she does it now, that's Word. Mm -hmm. And the um, page that was shown before was hand penciled, hand inked. Mm -hmm. This is a purely digital from layout mm -hmm. through inking through color to lettering. Mm -hmm. It's com entirely digital. So you've got the range from purely manual yeah. to purely digital. This page even uses a process called held color. If you look at Jinx's hair, you can see that instead of being outlined in black, it's outlined in kind of a slate blue. Yes, uh, top middle panel there. Yeah, there yes. you go. Yeah, the held color process is just another element uh, that, that Photoshop lends to give uh, uh, color vibrance and variety. Wow. 
Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a really amazing thing that, you know, you went from that early stage that you were describing and you were showing where you were literally writing it on what looked like lined paper mm -hmm. to it's amazing well, also this is because it's necessary we have so many more partners my scripts are now written for nate picos our letterer uh, and uh, the script has to be very clear and easy for him to read and if i if i remember right he actually takes the text from I th the script I, th I think he cuts and and pastes cuts and pastes into and using the elfquest yeah. font he created then he manipulates that into the bubbles. Yeah, and what and you places were, them. What you were looking at on that previous page is my lettering guides for Nate. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. So every page has a number of balloons on it to correspond to the dialogue, um, and and Nate requires that they be numbered so he knows where to put each piece of dialogue. And, and he is so good, by the way, that this is Wendy's guides. But occasionally Nate will say, you know, I think this would be stronger yes. or better. And he'll move a bubble or a, a caption box. And the man knows what he's doing. Well, and it's Nate, always better. Nate is another one of our kids. He actually grew up with ElfQuest. <laughs> and he's been lettering it for, t you know, 10 years now. Wow. And, uh, you know, he told us it was, he was just overwhelmed to, to think that this was something he, he grew up with and read as a kid. And, and now he... Uh, now he's doing it. He took Cutter all the way through uh, his full hero's journey. Well, I guess it's kind of cool for him, too. You know, he's like he's able to work on something that he always wanted to work on. Now, um, I asked you to show me your office and um, you're, it's a good thing you didn't give me your address because <laughs> I would be on on the way there now. Uh -huh. Tell us what we're looking at here in this first shot. OK. Um, in our house, we have uh, a separate office, which is in the basement, the finished basement. That's where I work. And Wendy has her studio upstairs, and I'm pretty sure I, I sent um, shots of that. Yeah. Um, but I have loved comics all my life. I have loved space and astronomy all my life. This is one of, I don't know, a dozen or two bookshelves that have all comics reference and cartoon reference and but also rockets because rockets nice. and, uh, <laughs> um, i love coming down here and working um i have worked in a number of offices and this one we we finally have the spaces oh yeah that we have always dreamed of oh yeah well it is awesome but i do have to ask us to jump back there was a question on uh part of the craft wendy so sure. question was where is it okay here you go i love being able to color lines to get that effect actually random question is aurori's hair white silver or blue white like jink aurori uh think of her hair as beige white it's it's kind of a cool bay if you were going to outline her hair in held color, you would use a cool beige and then shade it with beige, very much like Jink is outlined with blue and shaded with blue. There you go. Look at that. We got an act. We got a good, good question, Veronica. You win. Hold on. Let's give Veronica. <laughs> Let me just, hold on. Get the applause for, for that. So there you go. Thank you. No, thank you, Veronica. Okay. So we just saw the rocket ships, which of course rockets. And mm -hmm. the, uh, I would say that you have uh, between the two of you a lot of books. But that is that a technical term? A lot. Oh, well, <laughs> yes. And a, what you're looking at right there, isn't that the foreign? Yeah, the this editions? is this is just part of the foreign translations of ElfQuest because those shells go another three layers down and um, um, yeah, a lot. Uh, there's, a lot. There's, yeah, that's a technical term, isn't it? Richard? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a term of art. Um, I think this I, is the I first... know another term that actually suits it better, but I can't say it on the air. It, yes. So. <laughs> the it's second... Okay, Wendy, it's not, it's not a show for kids. <laughs> The second part of the term is ton. ton. Uh, <laughs> like I see you, I see you turning your head trying to read the spines. What, uh, what, what are your thoughts? Because you're a books guy, Mike. I know you. Yeah, know. yeah. There's, I mean, all that, that, that. I guess that, um, 
picture up near the puppet at the top? Is that a mm -hmm. series of book spines? Oh, no, Is that no. a puzzle or something? Yeah, that's... Oh, no, no, no. Um, first of all, the Skywise Muppet, that was done by uh, a friend of ours we've known forever, Kathleen um, David, Kathleen, uh, who, yes. who's, who's married to Peter David, the writer, oh. and uh, she's into puppetry, so she made us a Skywise Muppet. Next to him is... Um, a, a license that it's an art board. It's a piece of Wendy's art that's been printed onto slats. So that gives it the appearance of spines of books, mm -hmm. but it's a flat piece of art and it's, it's kind of neat. Yeah. That's kinda. very cool. Yeah. Kind of, I would say more than a little kind of <laughs> something like an S ton as well. So yes. let's, <laughs> let's jump along here. Um, Oh, Once yeah. again, Wendy, you love your hardcovers. It looks like you 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 got your hardcovers. We have we have some hardcovers. I finally, you know, after visiting friends, many friends who work for comics, and they they bind the comics they've worked ah, on. Into, like, that's what those black. You yeah. know, I just had long boxes of every ElfQuest comic, and I said, why don't I get a little professional about this? And so I had a, a book binder do all of ElfQuest the way I had seen it. It's, it's wonderful for research instead of digging through yes. individual comics. Um, these are just some of the things that have come out over the years. And, and of course, the gorgeous Dark Horse albums right there. Oh, yeah. Yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> but the, oh. these, I remember um, I had heard that John Byrne does these. And then when uh, Denny O'Neill had passed, uh, we helped get. Uh, Denny's bound works uh, up for auction and the fans loved it because that real that represented this was really theirs and I mm. I imagine this is one of one right this is these this are is these are one of one mm -hmm. um, I, I did it for me for for ease of research um, and I dare say that when the time comes everything you've seen on all of these shelves will go to Columbia along with uh, Wendy's artwork because wow. nice. They have a, a wonderfully uh, eclectic, large, and growing archive of comics and graphic novels. We were, I think, the second acquisition. I know. What an and, honor. And, and um, I want everything ElfQuest to go there so that 50 or 100 years from now, if somebody wants to say, what was this ElfQuest thing? They can go there and learn about it. I, that sounds great. Actually, uh, I think we've turned into the home shopping channel. Carol wants to know are those votive <laughs> candles something that one can buy. Not specifically Carol, but it, is it something that one could buy? <laughs> no, this was, uh, I said early on that um, fans send us all sorts of wonderful little gifties and tributes. These were done by a, a, stellar fellow by the name of Michael McAdam. Michael McAdam, who's also an com independent comics creator. Oh. And um, he, I, I forget how we found out about them. And I said, would you do a set for us? We, we do license certain things, but fan created um, gifts. We, we, we like to keep them, you know, intimate and personal. So if I were to gift you Mike Fasolo, would you keep him or would you send well, him? Well, he would oh, have well. he, he would have to go on walks with the dogs. Um, I can I can go I can do that. I could also go sit on the shelf with the Muppet. Oh, well, yeah. I want to know yeah, we just... how he would think about being slabbed. Oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's on my bucket list. That's on your bucket list. <laughs> well, he would... What would the CGC rating be? <laughs> Zero point one. Yeah, <laughs> very low. Very. You low. could make your own pretty easy. Yes, you could. Oh so yes, in our copious spare time, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been fascinated by the differences in coloring and the various overseas translations. Are the variations a matter of a publisher's choice, regional formulation of inks, or other factors? That is a very good question. Um, much of ElfQuest was done in black and white. And then there were color compilations that Wendy um, did or oversaw the, uh, the coloring of. Um, sometimes when a, a 
a collection of comics would go to a foreign publisher. Um, the original was never done in color. It was never colored by us. Uh, so that publisher made certain decisions as to what they thought the colors would be. And they would get uh, colorists who lived there who might be familiar with ElfQuest mm -hmm, and ElfQuest's mood to do the coloring. Um, I have to say, sometimes those colors look pretty spectacular. Sometimes they're like, I wonder why they thought that. <laughs> but, it, you know, if, if we licensed it to that publisher uh, and they asked nicely, can we do a color edition? And they showed us work that was that was acceptable at the very least, then certainly, you know, there's a color edition out there. It's not the one that we produced, but you can consider it a variant if you want. Wow, that's pretty, that is, I never thought of that. And, and you know, also the name Clarence Oddbody, I just felt like we should call You know where that's from? Well, I don't uh, know where It's Clarence a Wonderful is. Life. He was the is angel it? that saved George Bailey. I know. What? We should ring a bell. Oh, yes. Yep. What? Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. <laughs> Mike, you are... <laughs> You're your master. <laughs> you got your bell, Mike. All right, so let's get back to it. Uh, I that is a really random thing, Mike, but that's why you're our trivia guy. Um, Kevin uh, wanted to know uh, Columbia, as in Columbia University, is getting all of your archives. Yes, not the country from which. <laughs> not the coffee country. No. Yeah. Okay, no. just making sure. There we go. Okay. Um, let's get back to the, uh, the show and tell, uh, show and tell is over here. Um, okay. I'm guessing Wendy, this is yours. No, nope. nope, this is oh, where okay. we're sitting right now. This, this is, is, this is my desk okay. at the very far end of that long shot with the rockets. Um, that's the IMAX that we're talking to you on at this very moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's like the nerve center for the business and the editing and the so on and the so forth. Emphasis on nerve. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but uh, in addition to helping with whatever I can creatively, there's the business to be run. There's, there's all sorts of nuts and bolts, administrivia to, to take care of and this is where I do it. Um, and as I said, it's the first time I've been in a in an office space that I just feel so very comfortable and I can get a lot of work done. And then when I get tired, I just turn around and back and that's where <laughs> and you got tons of books are and I, I can read something neat. We've you both know? had had many different spaces, uh, different kinds of studios, different kinds of offices, but but where we are right now consolidates all our fondest wishes for what you know, we feel felt like we had been missing. Well, it's a great space, and, and there's more to show. Uh, are these art drawers? They are art drawers. Uh, those are two of, oh, I don't know, seven or eight uh, that uh, we keep original art in and scripts and so on and so forth. There used to be quite a few more, but that's where... Wendy's original art for the original quest and, and a couple of later series was that artwork has gone to Columbia where they're taking far better care of it than I would ever be able to. What, what's the street value of, of this picture? Here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing a lot. I'm just counting the, the shelves actually. And then L. Lennon asked, do we reach out to Karen for visits to Columbia? Yes. Obviously this is an insider I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, Karen Green is the head librarian, head archivist, I forget the exact title, of the the Archive of Comics. And um, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, at Columbia, um, she approached us 10 years ago wanting to know what we were doing with the original art. And she was the, the conduit by which we were able to solve a problem, which is what to do with all of this valuable stuff. So yes. Um, you contact her. She's on Facebook and probably 16 other social media oh, yeah. platforms. Um, 
and arrange it with her. You do need to go through some vetting. You need to uh, fill out some forms. And if you do get in, please wear gloves when you look at the art. No, they provide gloves. Okay. They provide gloves. <laughs> so if Mike is in the TSA no fly, can he still go and see your original art? I don't know that Columbia has a no look policy. <laughs> All right, just checking because it, Mike's a little embarrassed of that. Um, I do. Something right, like we go. So we, we're back to the art. We're not talking about Mike's felonies anymore. Uh, what are we looking at here? Oh, oh yeah. okay. Um, Great. I, I just, you know, you saw half of the photo a couple before was half of it. I just wanted to put together, you know, the core ElfQuest stuff. It, this is a brag. I admit it. Free. It's a flex. And, and you know what? After this much time, you, you're, you're entitled to the flex. Yeah. Lots and of flexing. Then, mm -hmm. then next to that is one of a number of display cabinets. This one is showing some of the action figure toys that have come out over the years. There's uh, uh, Dark Horse put out a series of three called mini busts of Cutter Skywise and Lita. That oh, they're were just really gorgeous. just uh, spectacular. Gorgeous. How amazing is that to see it dimensionalized like that when you finally see these kinds of things? What's that like? Well, I, I worked very closely with uh, the sculptor Tim Bruckner uh, on um, the, the Cutter Lita and Skywise busts. And uh, I, I did sketches for him. I did the characters from all angles so he could get an idea of how they looked from all dimensions. And uh, he just did. He killed it. An amazing interpretation of the characters. Yeah. Are these all available to, to buy somewhere? Um, these are all things that have come and gone out of um, out of production uh, years and years ago. We are always looking to uh, to see what might next be licensed. Um, but for a long time, as Wendy said, we've had space. We never had room to just look at the stuff we were accumulating and now yeah. we finally have the room to put it out there let it breathe yeah appreciate we could take it. it all out of the boxes and set it up as it all should. right well speaking of out of the boxes i'm sorry but there seems to be having a fan moment here it looks like you're <laughs> gonna have to address a fan fear moment here so oh. why is tildak blue oh. and well, well, somebody gonna... said tildak blue fly with him to columbia and then why is that tildak figure repainted and then Wi-Fi oh. cutter and I mean they're just going bonkers on you now. Well guys you're gonna be very excited about this because among the groups that did the, you see what you're looking at there are uh, uh figure uh, figure studies prototypes prototypes for the uh, action figures so uh Let's zoom in Hildak was sculpted by the Kyoto brothers who sculpted the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for their first movie. They made the costumes for that first movie. So, so they didn't know what color Tildak was, and one of them just painted him as he thought he should look. And we thought it was so cool, we, we just kept it. Well, yeah. it's not a case of we thought it was cool, we kept it. They offered us the prototype. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Took it right Mom. out of Kyoto without them knowing about it. Well, in yeah. other words, he kept it. Yes. <laughs> Richard, you were like, let me get a close-up of that. I need to see it. Right. <laughs> yes, but that's why Tildak is blue, because yeah. that was the prototype. They didn't know what color to make him, so they made him blue. Yeah. It sounds like your fans are relieved, but also ready with their credit cards. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would be If fun. you call before midnight. <laughs> it would be fun if these could be reissued. Uh, the, the group that uh, put them out. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the business went under, but, um, you know, let's see what happens. In let's the see what happens. Yes. All right. So let's keep going. Cause there is, uh, a little bit more to show. Ah, now oh, this is upstairs, upstairs with the deep, yes. that was Wendy. That was like ominous in the Aries. <laughs> okay. Tell us what we're looking at. We're looking at my digital studio, only digital art happens here. I don't do any painting or drawing here. So you're looking at my uh, computer screen and you're looking at my synchronized matching Wacom Cintiq. Wow. Now, do you work standing up or, or on this uh, uh, higher level chair? How does that work? <laughs> that kind of helps me to stand. Um, sitting is the new smoking. 
And, <laughs> and it takes me hours to do this work. So I stand up at the Cintiq to draw and I make sure to move around every couple of hours. And thank goodness we have dogs because I can walk them and get a little exercise. Um, but sitting for all that time is really not good for you. I have heard that. Mike, so stop sitting and smoking. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, pick one of the two because they're a yeah, right. <laughs> It's a tough call. Uh, Carol has has him in all the rest of the uh, the the right colors already, and uh, Carol just bragged. Okay, good. Now way over to way over to the right there, you can see that bright uh, that beautiful doll with the bright red kimono. Yep. That was a gift from Yumiko Igarashi, who is the creator of the famous Candy Candy manga. I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? Either. It's 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 a manga and anime. It's a manga and um, anime. It's a, a, a one romance. Of the pi pioneering anime. Absolutely, series. it was one of the very first romance uh, anime for girls. And and we were invited to Japan in 1994 as the United States ambassadors of independent comics, because of course comics are huge in Japan, but they wanted to know how we did it. Yeah, it was a symposium. Yeah. We, we, were very we weren't the only ones, but yeah. we represented independent comics. We were very honored. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? They were lucky to have you because of the, 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 the amazing work that you've done over the years. All right, we're looking at a keyboard? <laughs> we're looking at my miserable little Casio I, that I like to dink around on every once in a while. I Music is very big to me. Uh, it's an important part of my work. I listen to music all the time while I'm working. And sometimes she com composes it for one reason or another. Just hunt and peck. But <laughs> <laughs> and you're also looking at a little bit of my Maleficent collection. I collect, I collect versions of Maleficent. Wow, oh, look at that. Yeah. So the fans know how to get to your heart is what I'm understanding here. This is a little <laughs> hint. Play some music and give her Maleficent. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> and oh, here you are wielding a heck of a sword. Tell us what we're looking at here. These are some. Oh, oh, gosh. You're you are you are mashing up different <laughs> different uh, um, conventions that we've been at. The one on the left with Wendy holding this humongous sword. If you'll look carefully, right about in the middle of the blade. That third figure, the highest figure, um, is Lita, because this was Phoenix, and some guy who made this blade wanted different artists to adorn his sword. Uh, so Wendy did a Lita on there, and then we just had to get some photos of her going all Conan on us. <laughs> the the one on the right goes back oh my lord oh my, that's my that's my 80s hair so it has to be this early has 80s. this has to be a real early san diego comic con because there's us in the middle to the left is jack katz mm -hmm. who did first kingdom and to the right is dave sim who did cerebus so this clearly was a panel and note the the high tech card table yeah yes. i was saying this is like this is <laughs> things That's, have evolved a little bit since <laughs> then this all was right. a panel on independent comics it would have to be yeah all right and that oops almost missed one. there we go here yeah. it looks like uh, you and some of your fans this was one of the most amazing moments for us in the uh in the early 80s 81 81 uh it was the night of the masquerade at San Diego Con, and there were two enormous groups of kids who got themselves up as the, uh, the complete Elf Quest Wolf Rider tribe. So there were two competing tribes of the same characters, <laughs> and I think it amounted to 60 kids in all. I, I now, think there was more than that. And Gary Owens. Or false, Mike, is this you? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, but thanks for pointing it out, bud. Is that you? Yes. That Mike's is. an early fan. <laughs> Gary Owens, the voice of Space Ghost, the original voice of Space Ghost, was the host. That's him on the left. That's right? him on the left. That's, you know, and, and now, you know, but and, wait, there's more. And so he called, uh, you know, the, the kids came on and showed off their costumes. And I, I don't remember which group run, won, but he called 
both groups together to be all on the stage at the same time. And I remember he, we were down front in, in, in the front row and Gary just spoke to us off the stage. He said, do you see what you did? <laughs> Just look at what you did. Well, these people seem like they're having a good time. And, oh, and we were told that uh, 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 that Comic-Con, uh, uh, the committee assembled, said no more elves ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they said if we see one more elf, you know. <laughs> you caused a ruckus. Okay. Yeah. What are we looking at here? This, this was the 25th. No, this was the 20th. This 20th. was 1998. Mm -hmm. We were celebrating, again at Comic-Con, uh, ElfQuest's 20th. And again, uh, this was a party up on the roof somewhere. And uh, a bunch of fans all dressed up uh, as different ElfQuest characters sort of coalesced around us. And uh, that's the way it has been. Almost every show we go to, somebody at least shows up in costume, and occasionally there are tribes of them. Apparently, and they all look very happy to see you. Yeah. Well, uh, th these are happy times. You know, uh, we, we always feel like proud parents when our, our characters show up in real life for us. <laughs> I love this. This is great. So we're we're marching through history. What are we looking at here? Uh, one of oh, your. Oh, uh, this is where what? this is uh, San Diego 2003 because we have just oh. signed. You see, we started independent Warp Graphics, our own publishing company. Mm -hmm. And as I like to say, we're independent, we're not isolationist. Mm -hmm. We will team up with partners if they bring resources that we don't have. Mm -hmm. so 85, Marvel reprinted the original Quest. Mm -hmm. In 2003, we signed a, a, a license with DC Comics. Mm -hmm. They reprinted uh, classic material. Also, they did new material. And that's their booth. And that's us signing at the DC booth so, in 2003. Among other things, ElfQuest is, as far as we know, the only comic independent comic who's been published by all three of the major publishers, Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse. I couldn't say 100%, but it feels good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we continue on. Let's see where we are next. What, what, uh, oh, yeah. San Diego used to have this wonderful tradition where back in Artist Sally, they'd set up a podium or, you know, riser stage and they would provide easels and, and, and chalk and uh, Sharpies and paint. Mm -hmm. And anybody who wanted could go up there and do a large, you can see the size, uh, Portrait of Cutter, a portrait of Batman if you drew Batman, or Superman if you drew Super, or whoever. And then all of this wonderful artwork would go and be auctioned off. And, and Comic-Con would pick a charity every year and all of the proceeds. So this is 2005. This, this one I loved especially because it uh, the charity was uh, for uh, disabled fans, uh, uh, challenged fans. Uh, to have more access to things at the conventions, you know, oh, uh, nice. alterations being made in the convention center to give them more access. So I especially love that. And uh, I think this piece that I did went, it, it, I think it went for a chunk. It went for a chunk. And so we, we were able to contribute quite a nice chunk to that. Charity. Richard, did it go for an S ton? Is <laughs> All right. So what are we looking at here? It looks like. Uh, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> this is, again, two different uh, shows. Well, it might have been 2008. Uh, it, it was the same panel. This this all happened at the same panel in 2008. ElfQuest has always been under option, option to somebody for a movie or a TV series all these years. It just kind of goes from option to option to option. And uh, we have a love-hate relationship with Hollywood. No yeah. offense, Mike. No offense. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, Wendy, I th the uh, Veronica said, I 
think it was 2K that it went for. Uh, that sounds reasonable. That much or over, I think it was. Yeah, yeah Veron does Veronica own it? That's the question. <laughs> um, in 2008, ElfQuest was optioned by Warner Brothers. Wow. They were riding high after uh, Lord of the Rings. And uh, New Line also did the Harry Potter films. And so we were thrilled. And uh, Ross and Thurber, the fellow on the right with the microphone, was uh, uh, slated to be the writer and no, director. No, oh, uh, I beg your pardon. You're right. He was slated to be both the writer and the director. And he is another one of our kids who grew up on ElfQuest. And he had had a long de desire to uh, see if ElfQuest could be turned into a live action film. And, you know, that that didn't happen. But it's it's an experience that we remember. The other photo was Wendy with a, a dear friend of hers. Oh, yes. Va that's Valiford de Ambershay, one of the great costumers of all time. He, in fact, he's, he was a professional who worked with Bob Mackey and designed some costumes for Cher. But uh, he knows that I am a huge lover of Edgar Allan Poe and my favorite story is Mask of the Red Death. So he showed up at the back of the room at the panel as the Red Death and I just had to have a photo with him. <laughs> he put a little work into that one. There was a, there's a question here from the audience real quick. Uh, What's the current option status? Any hope for a series or film? And I, I, I do want to note and proceed this by saying Anthony does work in Hollywood in uh, props. So this might be a loaded question. <laughs> it, it is a loaded question. And we have been asked it, I don't know how Countless many hundreds times. of times. times. Um, I, we will just say there's always hope. Mm -hmm. And leave yeah. it at that because yeah. we have learned... When the check is cleared, <laughs> then you announce. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Always wait for the check to clear. Wait yes. for the check to clear. And then Laura said, I loved your version of Mask of the Red Death. Why, thank you so much. And and uh, if you want to see and hear the entire musical, go to maskmusical.com and uh, click on See the Show, and you can see and hear the entire musical. Wow, look at that. And uh, I should note, um, we do have quite a few talented individuals. There's an animator working out of Atlanta. The animation and post-production people in the peanut gallery wanted to know, too, what the option status was. So they're all interested in knowing if they can work on... <laughs> when we know, you will know. You and you won't need it. social media <laughs> because you'll hear the shouting. All the way from Poughkeepsie. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, looks like you had a pr couple pretty big honors here, uh, Eisner Hall of Fame. The, the uh, Before that, the one on oh. the right uh, with the banner, that was us at the Dark Horse booth. And that was in 2008 as well, because that was mm -hmm. the wrap up of Final Quest. You mean 2018? 2018. Yeah. I, yeah, they all well, it had together. an eight in it. It had an eight. Um, <laughs> Three years, they all blend together. <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> Um, and we thought, how can you top San Diego with a 40th anniversary uh, victory lap tour? And San Diego said, hold my beer. <laughs> because the following year in 2019, they said, we'd like to invite you to San Diego and we'd like you to come to the Eisner Award thing. Now, we had been presenters before. Yes. And so we thought, uh, uh, why are they doing this? But we went there. And everybody there knew except us. Yes, they kept it very, very close to the vest. We, we knew we had been nominated for the Hall of Fame, but there were five other nominees, all of whom are stellar people. And we thought, hey, I'll lose to any one of those and feel okay. Oh, yeah. And then they announced our names, you know, it's then like the EC comic. And then some idiot turned out the lights. It was that <laughs> kind of a shock. Yeah. Well, the Eisner's, you know, the Eisner Hall of Fame award, it's like winning uh, the Oscar lifetime, lifetime ach yeah. achievement. It's congratulations. Just yeah. It, it, it just, um, we're still, we still ride that high a little bit. Yeah. Um, and we didn't have to ask how you could top that because 
the next year, COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> and so there weren't, uh, you know, cons for a while anywhere. So you held on to the title there for a while. Uh, we, uh, they can't take it away. You can't <laughs> take it away. All right, your your audience is uh, is is applauding you. This this must be you accepting said yes. award. Yes, yes, and looking a little bit frazzled because we just weren't prepared. <laughs> you know, it was it was Ralph Cramden, and Hamana Hamana Hamana. Uh -huh. uh, it looks like somebody was taking pictures of the screen as you were going, yeah. and then um, a little additional cosplay. Yep. Fanny. Yes, I, I believe this was uh, Arizona again. It might have been, uh, uh, or maybe maybe San Diego. I I'm just trying to place it, but uh, yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, the, these are some of the top cosplayers uh, that that we know of uh, among ElfQuest fandom, and uh, they just do a tremendous job. They do. Um, you're getting a lot of. So I had asked you to give us a little bit of a peek. We're getting kind of late in the time. So we're going to go through this at a slightly faster clip. Talk to us about your influences uh, in storytelling. Well, you're very right to show this poster of Alex Sam the Great, which was the first anime to reach America in 1961 uh, from American International. Uh, and uh, I saw it in theaters. It was my first exposure to anime and it completely destroyed my mind as a 10 year old. Uh, I had grown up on Disney and Warner Brothers. I had never seen storytelling in animation like this. And this was of course, directed by Osamu Tezuka who's considered the Walt oh, yeah. of Japan. And uh, I, I immediately lost my mind and became a, a blazing otaku, which, which you know, is a wonderful word that just means out of control anime fan. Um, and I was the only one, you know, in the world. I thought because uh, you know this was very new to America; nobody had ever heard of it. So you didn't go on Twitter and find other yeah. fans. Uh, uh, social like, media wasn't helping. Back out. in 1964, <laughs> <laughs> 61, excuse me. Yeah, and, no. and she immediately, the way she spoke earlier, absorbed the look mm -hmm. of this and made yeah. it part of her inner uh, toolkit yeah. as a budding artist. Oh, right. Elf, Quest, Elf Quest Otaku. And, and <laughs> on the right is Aubrey Bearsley, which yes. is one of your 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 baroque uh... well my grandmother was a school teacher and she had uh, quite a library of her own of books from the turn of the previous century it was it was a library of antique books and uh, among them were uh, fairy tales and legends illustrated by the great illustrators uh, such as C. Aubrey Beardsley, which you see here, Arthur Rackham, um, uh, Dulac, uh, um, who which else? I, I, I know I said. Yeah, I think you have a few more in here. Let's yes. uh, show a few more. Oh, yes, there's Rackham. And, and so, again, all of this I just absorbed as a child and, and uh, just needed to, to learn how to do that. And and you can see the line of beauty in this work. The, the beautiful curving organic lines uh, was just instilled in me in, in a very early age. So naturally, I, I, I was kind of destined to become a fantasy artist because this is what inspired me. In, this in is stunning. I've never, Mike, yeah. have you ever seen anything like this? No, this is great. I haven't seen anything I've like I've never that. seen anything. You've never seen Arthur Rackham's work? <gasps> never. Oh, oh, you poor baby. No. Oh, please get thee to a library. Yeah. And now, well, now oh, that yeah. I, I'm oh. going to have to rewatch this episode and write down what you, what you. Dulac, so, Rackham. Um, I've this is amazing. Oh. This is, a, I saw no, this you, is great. This is you, you have seen his work because if you've seen Disney's Sleeping Beauty, he, oh. designed, he designed all the backgrounds for Disney Sleeping Beauty and painted most of them. <laughs> and so. and and again, there is that line, but there's a little bit of an edge to it. Yes, you know, spooky, spooky edge to it that Wendy mm -hmm. also incorporates into ElfQuest in the appropriate places. Oh yeah, is this is this just as a quick question? This is on this is before computer design, right? This is yes. all hand. 
This, this, the, he used to paint in gouache, and of course, he also painted in oils. Uh, but uh, but he would often do studies in gouache. This yeah. is amazing. I, and and yeah. I, I have to tell you, this has been an education for Mike tonight as yeah. well. Right, Absolutely. Mike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mike is saying, let's keep going. Keep going. So what, what are we no, looking at? This is a, a gorgeous work. I mean, Wendy, this is amazing. And you can see Sleeping Beauty's castle and the mm -hmm. forest surrounding it in this. But uh, I, I also absorbed a lot of Ivan Durrell's uh, color sense because I, I have a very dark streak. I am, I am definitely a horror fan, and there are a lot of very dark moments in, Elf, in ElfQuest. And, uh, you know, this, this type of influence would help me to depict that in color. It's so, right, Mike? I mean, there's yeah. so much depth. Awesome. Mm -hmm. It is really great. You know, Mike works in animation, and he's, Mike, you're going to draw this. Right. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a new uh, Wacom tablet. And, and Are you an animator, it. Mike? No, no, I'm a writer. Oh. <laughs> he's an animation writer. Stop. He he's won. Oh, three, he, he's won three TV Emmys for for writing for animation. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mike is pretty. Well, Mike, you got a round of applause. <laughs> and, and what are we looking at here? This uh, this, this is something I love to show. Because when we do a panel or anything like that, and I'm giving props to her because, um, as I said, the, the, the seed and the stuff of ElfQuest come from her. She has been writing and drawing literally since she was two years old. Yeah. This is a book that she had. It's a book of fairy tales. I just it's, realized that this is what that and is. And she has drawn two little elves with the pointed hats, and they are reacting to the illustration the girl is dropping the pastries and they're saying look out don't you know don't hit us she was doing interactive <laughs> story unbelievable too and it just it stuns me every time i love it even that back is... then you knew what you wanted to do and i was obviously i was cursed to tell stories about elves from that very time on. Yeah, I think it's going to work out okay with you if you stick yeah, with it. I think yeah. it's going to work yeah, out. Okay. Keep pushing something. for it. Yeah, Keep yeah. it'll yeah. eventually happen. Yeah, Keep working on it. We're patient. All right, and then I think this is the last one. And uh, talk mm -hmm. to us about what we're looking at here. Well, you see, uh, back back in those days, in in the sixties. It was very, very difficult to get a hold of uh, manga. It was, again, it was something new to the West. Uh, you could find it in a place like uh, in, in uh, Japantown, in San Francisco, Little Tokyo, in Los Angeles. So I had started to connect with other fans uh, in, in my, uh, my mid-teens. I had started to meet uh, other fans and to discover that there were other people who were interested in the same thing I, wa I was. And so every once in a while, someone would, would send me one of these honking, huge manga, they, and they were like printed on Ditto Master or whatever. They were purple, uh, not like what you see today at Newberry Comics or something. Uh, but, um, you know, again, this just reading this and learning how to do layouts. That's why ElfQuest just has this Asian feel to it. They've, they, someone has said that ElfQuest is indeed America's first manga. Yeah. And it's in part because Wendy was influenced by this art style, but was also able to merge with a, a Western sensibility, yeah. a Jack Kirby, mass and power sensibility yes. and take those two really opposing things and make them work together that I've I've never seen anybody else do it. Well, it's weird and it's and it's hard to copy. <laughs> Your fans are uh, absolutely loving this and I think we're at oh we're almost at the end here. This was oh. a, a direct influence I think you wanted to note. Well, no, not really. It's just that you can see the similarity, but you, you know, you can cutter is painted in watercolor here and and there's kind of a flowing movement to it and the eyes are very piercing. And this other piece of art is an example of, you know, highly rendered 
um, uh, anime art, and uh, you, you can you can see similarities. The the anime art was not an influence on this particular painting, but but you can see similarities. I gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, more more of the manga style, and and again. If, if you're very familiar with ElfQuest comics, the moves that Cutter makes with the sword, you know, that oh. Wendy that Wendy draws yeah. very animatedly, yeah, are influenced yeah. by that. And of course, this samurai top knot and all of that is in there. <laughs> very good. So, uh, if people want to find out more about your newest book, they can go to elfquest.com. Uh, to check out Stargazer's Hunt. This is uh, the part of the show now uh, where we ask a question that we ask to all of our creators. And that is, what is one piece of advice that you wish you had received earlier in your career? Don't take things personally. Because you're, you're going to get all kinds of feedback, all flavors of it. Some of it's not going to be very nice, and some of it's going to be terrific. Praise and blame all the same. For me, I think it would have to be something along the lines of, in carpentry, they say, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> in business, and in particularly the business of publishing and entertainment and licensing, if you think you've checked somebody out enough, you haven't. Mm -hmm. Check them out some more. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that we haven't made too terribly many mistakes in 45 years. No, I don't think so. I, we don't have that many regrets, no. No, but whatever mistakes we or I as a business person have made, it has been from not going to the last decimal point, checking something out, mm -hmm. maybe being just too enthusiastic mm -hmm. or something. Just check, check, and check. Yeah. It'll, wow. it'll serve you. Wow. This is, uh, and they, they, we've heard, we just said both great advice yeah. and then advice from the audience. Uh, apparently sign up for the ElfQuest newsletter <laughs> if you haven't already. So that's a bit of advice from the audience. And then Mike, I think the next part is, is from you. Uh, this is uh, Mike's Ooh, uh, yay, trivia. trivia time where Mike gives us a trivia prompt. Mike, why don't you lead us on the trivia prompt? Well, the trivia this week is uh, the children of Woolpit. Uh, there were two kids that kind of came out of nowhere in the 12th century. And they were both, uh, they, they appeared very green, the color of their skin. Um, and they would only eat green beans for some reason. And eventually they learned to eat other foods and, and things like that. And they learned to speak English because they, they came out of the woods, out of nowhere. I was going to um, say, were they raised by wolves or something? <laughs> well, that's the thing, because after they learned to speak English, well, the girl at least, because the, the boy got sick and he died. But after they learned to speak English, she would tell these crazy stories about um, coming from another land where the sun never shone and the light was always like twilight. And... According to that, everything in the, according to her, everything in the world was green. So that was like the world that they said they came from. And mm -hmm. no one ever knows, no one ever knew where they came from or how they got there or what anything was about. And it was just a, I thought a kind of, cause they were green, even though elves aren't green. It's like, eh, it's kind of an elf like yeah. thing. They came out of the woods and the, the whole green man. Uh, green man. Uh, that's just mythology. what I was thinking. But you see, my mind goes in a direction that minds shouldn't go. <laughs> They'd been there for so long and they hadn't washed in so long that they got moss and they were little swamp things. And, and um, there you that go. That was very Grimm's fairy tale of That's you. That's a good one. Yes. yes. <laughs> very Grimm's of you. And Wendy, what would you, what would you do with the wool pit prompt? What would I do with it? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you sort of have the hidden ones. Oh, yes. We actually do have creatures in ElfQuest that are, are very... Um, mm, Organic. Or, <laughs> very, very odoriferous. Huh. Um, <laughs> they, uh, 
you know, if somebody asked me to illustrate this story, I would illustrate the children coming out of the woods and uh, the, the peasantry reacting to them as they came out of the woods. Yeah. And see, what that just sparked in me was this, I don't know, 16th century Italian uh, painter, Archimboldo, I think his name was, who did the faces out of vegetables and fruits. Yes. Mm. And so if these kids were coming out of the woods, they wouldn't be flesh and blood. They'd be leaves and vines, and they'd just start be starting to take human. Mm. I like nice. it. Yeah, All right, Mike, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I, I think if I had the wool pit prompt, I would take this in a paper moon grifter type of thing with Ryan O'Neill and Tatum O'Neill uh, somehow using this as a grift to get money out of people at a time before there was an internet. So uh, they hear that this town has a legend of people, the green people, and the father and daughter turn it into a grift. And that's what where I would go with this story. Yeah, I wonder how long that would last. <laughs> Not 40 years, I'll tell you that. If they, it, only, it only has to last uh, 90 pages to make it a screenplay, that's all. <laughs> they get there to discover that the Hulk has already visited. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. And Mike, where, where would you go with this? Um, I would have it be that those kids are from a like either a subterranean world or another dimension. And they are either um, like experiments that have escaped and mm -hmm. they've somehow got to this world. And now the the people from the other world, the scientists, are trying to get them back somehow. See, that's, like that's, that's very elf quest there because yeah, yeah. the elves come from another world. Mm -hmm. They are out of place. They're trying to survive yeah. and find out who they are. There's not people chasing them, but they are strangers in a strange land. Yes, the, our, our elves' appearance as elves is um, not their true form, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And the audience continues to come up with their ideas <laughs> as they do every week during this. Uh, and, and Wendy and Richard, might I uh, suggest that you option Mike, uh, just option him? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, um, I'm. I'm. I'm, have, I'm you try, you could then it. option. He could live in your house, and walk your dogs. Can, yeah, walk your dogs. Okay. He's very Sit on the shelf. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm very quiet. I don't think Wendy's going for it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could. I can hear the wheels turning. Well, when you say <laughs> option you him, not. we'd have to have the license. Own the license. That's right. Him. Nobody else. Yeah. Nobody else would have access. For, yeah. you know, Mike's license is cheap. Nobody wants it. <laughs> no, that's only if we if we like bought him. Okay, if we buy him, he can't reproduce. That's right. We don't the copyright. We don't so. the trademark. And Mike, you've been optioned. There you it's go. A good plan. I like it. Wendy and Richard, where can your fans find you, and uh, where will you be next? Where's the best place for them to follow you? Well, they can always find what we're all about at ElfQuest.com. Yes. We just did a major facelift on the website. We're very proud of it. And there's more stuff there, including 10,000 pages of story you can read for free. Wow. ElfQuest.com. It's all there. It's easy to navigate. Mm -hmm. We are heading a week from tomorrow. We are going to San Diego. Uh, for Comic-Con, we're doing uh, Rose City in Portland, Oregon in September. Also, Baltimore Comic-Con in September. Beyond that, we don't have any plans. We're balancing being on the road and we may drop taking in on it easy. New York Comic-Con. We may drop in on, on New York Comic-Con. This is true. Might but drop in. It looks like your fans are really appreciative that you came here uh they thank you so much for for this they'll uh, veronica will see you at rose city and of course everybody uh should uh like comment and subscribe uh to learn more and then uh we will have uh links in the show notes uh so that you could see more of uh the reference that they provided wendy and richard thank you so much for joining us yes, we're gonna thank you and we're going to ask you to go into uh, the green room. Uh, Mike has provided Oreo cookies and licorice, so feel free to get sugared up. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. Don't go away. We will be uh, right back uh, to see you right after we close out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now.
Mike, that was wild, huh? That was that was great. That was really good. All that all that uh, background information is fantastic. I cannot believe that they had been nurturing this story for forty years. Yeah, and that's they pivoted, and now they're still going. It is mind blowing. Forty mind years, blowing. and it's still going strong. And a true independent spirit, right? They just yeah. went out and they didn't. Uh, they they went out. They had a vision. They told their vision and they made it possible uh, for their fans to follow their stories. So I think this is an inspiration for everybody who has an idea, who uh, feels like they have a story, even if it potentially isn't the most commercial story. If you do it and you stick to it, you will find your audience. And uh, I just have to say that their their audience here is just amazing. Yep. Awesome. So, Mike, we'll see you next Tuesday, and uh, I don't know who we have uh, next week. We'll make it up as we go. And thanks to Dark Horse for, uh, for booking Wendy and Richard Penny. Thank you so much, Mike. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.